Let me begin by reading some words from scripture. These from the second book of Corinthians, chapter five, beginning at verse 11, going through to the first couple of verses of chapter six. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others, but we ourselves are well known to God, and I hope that we are also well known to your consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain, for he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. There's a lot in those words. There are certain passages of scripture that contain so much light and life for us. Paul writes to a fledgling church in Corinth that has done the first century equivalent of Google searching their theology. They've, they've gone to find first century podcasters, if you like, who have spoken to them all kinds of stuff about spirituality and about people's image of God. Most of it, not necessarily God as seen through Christ. Paul in this letter, in many ways, doesn't defend himself, but defends the gospel of Christ, the truth of Christ Jesus to those who have heard other voices speaking other things instead to them. In this particular passage, Paul addresses a couple of the fundamental questions that the, the Corinthian church was asking and that we all ask, I believe. Those being, what is our purpose in life? And as well as that, why did Jesus die? In this passage, Paul draws the curtain back slightly on an eternal mystery and opens up just a little to us, a perspective on why Jesus died. Firstly, let me take us to the point where Paul writes that Jesus died for all. Verse 14, for the love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all. Sisters and brothers, it's quite clear. Jesus didn't just die for some, but for all of creation. This is an inclusive gospel no matter who people are, where they are from, how they are living in this moment, the salvation of Jesus is for them. This is a message that's not exclusive to the Christian church, to a particular group in the world. 
this is an inclusive gospel that is for all people. It's verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Particularly in the evangelical church, we have, I think, sometimes personalised the gospel message. That's not untrue. Jesus did die for you personally, but actually Jesus died for all of creation. It's not a my Jesus, my saviour, a personal in my own pocket Jesus that died for us. It's the creator of the whole universe who gave his life so that we might all be restored to relationship, so that all creation. This message that Paul talks about is both personal to individuals, but very much a cosmic message of reconciliation of all things to the one who created them. All this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. What is our purpose in life? God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Again, there's different ways of interpreting this. Our ministry is to reconcile those that, that aren't seeing eye to eye, but the truth be told is that just by being in Christ, by choosing to live the, the kingdom of God way, rather than the kingdom of this world way, just by doing that, we are a sign of God's reconciliation. Simply the only one who could reconcile all things was God in Jesus Christ. You and I cannot do that. Equally, we in our own strength can't reconcile ourselves to relationship with God. This work of reconciliation is the work of Christ. But if we are in Christ, if we are signs of this new creation, then that has become our ministry. To demonstrate a different way of living to live according to the laws and rules of God rather than those that prevail upon us from all kinds of voices that we hear. To live our lives in a way that reflects Jesus rather than in a way that reflects the priorities of the world around. That requires boldness and courage. For us to do that today means that we, we go against the flow, that we stand out from the crowd. It has always been the way for the followers of Jesus to do that. What might that mean to, for you and for me today? How might you be being called to be a sign of the new creation that Jesus brought in his death and resurrection to this whole cosmos? What is the way that that huge picture might look in micro form in your life and your existence this week? Where will you be a witness for Christ? part of the mission of Christ in the world now by living the life of one who recognises themselves to be reconciled to him. As we come to an end, let me read some words to you from a second century Christian writer that helps us reflect on this incredible sense of exchange that we read in these verses, that in Jesus, he became sin for us so that we can be the righteousness of God. Let's finish with reflecting on these words. O sweetest exchange, O unfathomable work of God, O blessings beyond all expectation, the sinfulness of many is hidden within the righteous one, while the righteousness of the one justifies the many that are sinners. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you, we are so thankful, Jesus, that you came to this world that had rejected you, 
that you demonstrated in your actions and in your words a new kingdom, a different way, a new creation. And Lord, in your death and your resurrection, you invited us to be part of that new kingdom, taking the sin not just of me, not just of those of us watching this today, but the sin of the whole world for all time, becoming sin yourself in that moment, so that in your risen life, in your victory over death, we become your righteousness, that which we cannot achieve on our own, you have given us as the most incredibly abundant, generous, outrageous gift. Lord, may we know this week what it means for ourselves to live as that new creation, but also to be your ambassadors in a world that so desperately needs to know that you, Jesus, died for all, that they too can be part of this new creation, that they too can know what it means to have that sense of purpose in life, of rightness, right living in your eyes because of that which you have given to us. We recognise today our complete dependence on you, our Father, and we recognise, Spirit of God, that you in this world, in our lives, help us to live for you. So my prayer today is that you might be in us and work through us in this world, that this world might see and recognise your new creation and that you are the one who have brought us together again. May your peace be upon those listening to this. May they know your joy and may they live for your kingdom. Hear our prayer. Amen. God bless you.